This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Optical Cables by Corning. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3.0 optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. On today's show, you'll know how to brew beer. Welcome to Know How, it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Balliser. Pass me the rock. And I'm Brian Burnett. <laughs> and for the next however many minutes take takes, we're going to be showing you some of the projects that we've been playing with so you can take them home and geek out on your own. Brian. Padre. So we've got a little something different for the folks today. A little bit different, a little different. Uh, this is a project that I would say is near and dear to my heart. Something that I have a bit of experience in testing, but not so much in I don't think it's near and dear as much as it's near and beer. Beer. Near and beer. Near oh, beer. that's funny. We actually have a little Oh, wait, is there right going to be drinking on the know-how set? Uh, would that be a first? I don't I think, think so. No, probably not. I don't not. think it would probably be not. a first. But, mm -hmm. yeah, now you may have guessed that we are going to be doing a couple of episodes here on brewing beer. This is actually a DIY topic. It's one that was requested a long time ago. Unfortunately, neither of us really have any beer brewing experience. No, no. I, you don't drink, or really. You're going to pretend that this beer. is beer. Yeah, okay. you're, you're more this of a Coca-Cola drinker. Yeah, I, and, you know, I, here's the thing, though. I also don't like eating vegetables, but I like growing crops. So it's all about <laughs> the right. knowledge. Yeah, it's all about learning. Um, maybe the first thing we should do is show people how to pour a beer. Oh, because you wouldn't do not, it like that. Really? Am I not doing it the right way? Not unless you want a re just a frothy head that I just comes overflows. Isn't that a good thing? Not, not normal. You want to tilt the glass and gently pour the beer along the side of the glass. So wait, tilt. And then as you get to the top, a little faster. Oh, okay. You want a little bit of head. So, like for sure. a little, like tilt, and uh -huh. then. Yeah. And, you know. And that. <laughs> well, it doesn't help if you sample the bottle right away. Is that, is that how this yeah, works? Yeah, that's pretty much how okay. it works. You've got it. You're so, natural. Oh, so the idea is not to make it really foamy. Yeah, uh, I mean, it depends kind of on the beer, but most most chance, most things are you don't want more than, you know, that much. Okay, Brian, I, I have to ask this before we get into the heavy stuff. I, I know people love beer. Mary Jo Foley, mm -hmm. she loves beer. I very much respect her. You and Russell and Alex, you, you consider yourselves, you know, you're a bit more than just get me whatever beer. You you, you have your tastes. We, we're beer fans, and coming from Petaluma, too, we're the, right. you know, we're from... Down the street, the literally big, down the street. Literally down the street now. Lagunitas is one of the biggest breweries uh, in California and I think the country now, but... And, and actually, our old studio is going to be a brewery, so, hey, yeah. you know, we've got connections. So it's definitely getting popular. Actually, an interesting fact was that uh, in the 1980s, there was like only 60 breweries in the country, and now there's over like 1,400 breweries. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we actually have uh, Jimmy Carter to thank for that too. Well, see, that's that's the thing. I, I think there are a lot of people, including some of my Jesuit brothers, mm -hmm. who they love brewing their own beer, and it's not necessarily because they can't get that flavor anywhere else. It kind of appeals to geeks, you know, geeks who, it's who, a chemistry who want to thing. find the perfect formula or yeah. their special thing that no one else does. It gives their beer a special flavor, yeah. and, and you know, I'm actually very drawn to that. I wish I, I wish I actually did enjoy beer so that I could do that part. <laughs> well, you know, just because you don't enjoy beer doesn't mean you don't have to not make it so other people could enjoy it. Because, you know, actually, like, way back when in the medieval times, uh, monks were the best beer makers and still are in some cases. Well, I mean, yeah, because when you have nothing else to do. <laughs> nothing else. Actually, <laughs> Twit is a good analog because yeah. I can do a lot of shows because I have no social life. I have no family to take care of. And yeah. when I go home, I basically sit at my desk and go, hmm, what do I do now? Yeah, I guess let's build something. Uh, you know what? Uh, there's something to be said for that because the stuff you come up with is pretty good. So. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> Other times, it's me making things I don't drink or eat. Uh, but you know, right, coming wait, wait, back wait, to so the basics. Tell me about this. So the basics of beer is pretty I, simple. I hear people say like light and dark. Does that actually mm. make a difference? What, what are we talking about here? It, you know, it does. I, it, it all depends on what kind of flavor you want. Like this is a heavier beer. This is uh, Lagunese's daytime ale. And then the difference between like an ale and a lager is all about the yeast. So I mean, breaking down beer to its very basic form, it's just, it's malt, hops, yeast, and water. And then 
you know, that form of combination and letting it ferment for a while. Like the malt is for the fermenting process, the sugar for the yeast to grow and create CO2, which gives you the bubbles and right. then also the alcohol. Um, but then the hops are used for like flavoring. And then also the, um, the malt is where you would get like the darkness. So okay. how long you roast the malt, the darker the beer. Uh, but that changes the flavor, right? Because I, mean, I always hear people say, oh, you know, I, I prefer a lighter IPA or a darker lager. And I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm what sure that mean? makes sense. But in my head, it's mm -hmm. like someone saying, mm -hmm. Ah, oh, the Chardonnay. Yes, I like the fingers. <laughs> the fingers rolling down the glass. Give me yes. the taste of tannin and bark with soil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's definitely your, your connoisseurs of, uh, of beer. And the easiest explanation is that their ales are a top fermenting yeast where they're, they're brewed at like a warmer temperature. So the yeast grows at the very top during the process. And then a lager is more of a, um, a cooler process. So like back in Germany, back mm. in the day, the way they would make uh, lagers is they put the barrel in caves and keep it cool, like around 50 degrees. And then the yeast would grow from the bottom and it would create oh. a more like uh, a smoother kind of beer. That's less, actually very cool. Yeah, so there's, there's really neat ways of getting different flavors out of beer in the process and what you throw into it. But um, I mean, just some quick uh, history beer facts that I, I came across that was pretty interesting is that Beer making has been around for 6,000 years, and a lot of people attribute it to the uh, formation of civilization, actually, because to be able to brew beer, you had to coordinate with other people. Right, and, <laughs> and also, in order to brew beer, the first time someone brewed beer, what happened was it was some sort of beer making material that had gone bad. It had started fermenting. Right. That only happens once you move from a, a hunting gathering society to one that's actually doing some sort of organized farming. Yeah, and it, it is like a good way of, um, of keeping like carbs, keeping a, a, something that would spoil and like keeping it for a long amount of time. So that's kind of like the idea of how it may have came about. But um, some of the other things were like, <laughs> I was, uh, so all my research, I found out the, the pilgrims wanted to actually go further south when they landed at Plymouth Rock, but they were out of beer. <laughs> so they're like, you know what, we'll just make do. We know that the weather here is terrible. So we'll, what, yeah. what you're saying is that if they had a couple more barrels on board, the mm -hmm. United States of America might actually be down in South America. Yeah, yeah. All right. Would. Yeah, and then <laughs> another one that I found pretty cool was, uh, so Prohibition, you know, happened, and that mm -hmm. was about a decade where we weren't uh, able to, a lot of breweries went out of business because of Prohibition, and then also it was followed by World War II, and then yeah, the Dust Bowl. Yeah. So, like, all these things kind of ran into each other and made it so that a lot of breweries went out of business, and it changed so that there's only a few breweries, and they had to make the things that they had last longer. So that's how you, why like Budweiser right. and mm -hmm. Coors, like these lighter beers are like popular in America, which before Prohibition, that wasn't the case. Like it was very much more like European beers. And, and you know, know, that's a history thing because that's the same reason why we have like salted and preserved and smoked meats was mm -hmm. because, well, they needed a way so that it wouldn't go bad. <laughs> they couldn't just eat everything that they had caught killed and slaughtered and cooked, right. they, they needed a way to extend that life. Well, I could see the same thing. It's like, look, okay, we've got this, this beverage it's, you know, if we leave it there longer, it actually starts to make us feel kind of funny. Huh, <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, uh, one of my beer brewing Jesuit friends, and he, he was telling me how his secret is he's found out a way to be exact about how much sugar is left <laughs> in the beer because you don't want to ferment all of it sometimes. No. Sometimes you want a little bit of a sweet taste. Right. And uh, that's like his key to success. He, he made me try his beer and I'm like, hey, it tastes, like, uh, tastes like beer. He goes, no, no, this is more <laughs> like a mead. I'm like. All right, man. Sure. And yeah, meads are really sweet. And then, like you said, with the the, the curing meats, like IPAs. The only yeah. reason IPAs exist is because on the way to India and back from India, they had to put a bunch of hops in the beer to get it to last longer. And that, <laughs> but uh, that also it changed the flavor. The flavor it made it more alcoholic. Speaking of the flavor, uh, so we had a Pico Brew kit on New Screen Savers a while back, mm -hmm. and uh, we forgot to send this back. Forgot, we, huh? We forgot. Well, it was because it was. <laughs> they say you have to keep this in the fridge because this has the yeast and the hops in it. So I, I actually took a peek. I have no idea what I'm looking at. So in here, which we've been keeping in the fridge, hmm. they they've got these three packages. <laughs> I have no idea. So that's yeast. I guess. So, I, yeah. And I guess. Well, this is uh, hops. No, these would no, be the hops. That would be the hops because yeah, you can see the little. Uh, little so what is this? This is just the sugar. What's this? Is like cocaine? Is I'm this cocaine not, beer? Uh, you know, that's why I actually have a couple kits to build stuff. 
because uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know what this is. This looks like it could be hops. Maybe maybe malt or something in there. Oh, that's that's probably what it is. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what beer this was supposed to be, but uh, keep this box of yeast and hops in your fridge. You think that you should, oh, we, this hasn't been in the fridge, has it? <laughs> no, it, no, it actually, has? that's why I got it out, okay, of, I okay. got it out of the fridge. That's why okay. We've there. killed the poor little guys. <laughs> oh, no. Actually, that, that's uh, one of the things that they told me, which is, and this is true all the time, uh, you don't kill yeast. I mean, yeast can always be active. Can it? Uh, you mean you can, you can starve it of the materials uh, that you yeah, need yeah. it, to, or, you, or you can deactivate it, mm -hmm. but, I mean, it's always there. You could reactivate the fermentation process. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And it's kind of cool. Uh, one is a Mr. Beer kit that I got a get as a gift a while Mr. ago. Mr. Beer. Mr. Beer. Right. Yeah, it, like Mr. Coffee? Mr. Beer. Mr. I, I Beer, it. keeping right. it simple. And uh, so I got it as a gift. I've been putting off using it, but by the end of these episodes that we do, we're going to do a taste test and see how it comes out. Well, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and take a walk on the beer side. How easy is it really to make your own beer? It should be simple, right? Water, malt, hops, let some yeast do its thing, and you've got yourself a refreshing beverage, hopefully. The Mr. Beer Kit offers a tagline of the complete home brewing system, and I plan on putting that to the test. On the back of the box, they list only four steps, which, to, let's be honest, is an oversimplification, but they do guarantee results, good or bad. Inside the kit, you get caps, Mr. Beer stickers, eight bottles, a two-gallon fermenter, and no-rinse cleanser. And of course, brewing ingredients. For my first batch of beer, I decided to go with something seasonal rather than the prepackaged pale ale that came with the kit. I chose an Imperial Red Ale from Mr. Beer's seasonal collection. Included with the red ale was a dry ale yeast. Yummy. Of course, as a man, before you start anything, you should take a good hard look at the included instructions and then immediately ignore them. Just kidding. Fortunately, the instructions come with pictures and are concise, so let's get started. First, you'll want to assemble a spigot for your fermenter. Be sure to have the concave side of the rubber gasket facing outward, and then simple twist till tight. When brewing beer, perhaps the most important part of the whole process is sanitization. Screw this part up and you'll have some funky flavors in your beer from bacteria, and not only will you have to throw out the whole batch, but you won't find out for another two weeks from the brewing date. So spray down your work area and wipe clean. Fill your keg up with lukewarm water up to the four quart mark. Then add half of the no rinse cleanser, screw the top back on and shake vigorously. It's a good idea to do this over the sink as the top of the keg has ventilation notches to release pressure during the fermentation process and will leak a little bit of water. Place any tools you'll be using into the keg. I'll be using a rubber spatula, whisk, and can opener. Allow the tools to soak for about 10 minutes before placing on a plate or bowl that you've sanitized by running the spigot with the cleanser over it. Fill the keg up to the four quart mark with cold water. I'll be using tap water, but this is the water that will be used for the beer, so if you want, you can use filtered water or bottled water, that's perfectly fine. Just don't use distilled water, as the yeast needs minerals in the water to grow. Depending on the brew, this part might be different, but for my red ale, I'll be bringing four cups of water to a boil, and then adding the can of red ale wort. While waiting for the water to boil, make sure to have a corgi looking on disapprovingly, adding to your guilt for not paying attention to him. Remove from heat and pour in your ingredients. This is called the wort, and use the rubber spatula to get every last syrupy ounce out of the can. Stir around till the wort is no longer syrupy, and uh, looks like delicious black sludge. Mm. Carefully pour your wort into the fermenter and fill your keg up to the eight and a half quart mark. Use the whisk to stir up the water and wort together. And now is time for the yeast. For this brew, the recommended method is to just pour the yeast on top and do not stir. Once again, feel the guilt flow through you as the corgi continues to judge with boredom. Screw the tap back on and place the fermenter in a dark location with consistent temperature between 68 to 76 degrees for 14 days. After 14 days, it's time to bottle. Use the other half of the cleanser to soak and fill the bottles and then fill each bottle with two and a half teaspoons of sugar. That's what the yeast will use to carbonate and finish the fermenting process of the beer. 
Cap the bottles and again wait 14 days while placing the bottles in a dark place with a consistent temperature. And in the end, you should have some beer, but we'll have to taste test it to be sure. That's, you know, that's that's fascinating. That's actually very yeah. geeky. I, I have to admit, there's something about having setups with like glass containers and tubes and piping that just yeah. makes me think, I'm making moonshine. <laughs> it gives you that feeling, yeah. Uh, and also, it's fun to see like the chemistry aspect of it and the different measures yeah. of things that you need and the ingredients. And the nice thing about beer is that you just, you. You spend like a, an intensive couple of hours or whatever it is to, to get it ready, and then you wait six weeks and you enjoy. Yeah. yeah. And I could totally see why some people get obsessed with this because it takes you that you know month and a half to get what you want. Mm -hmm. And then there's always going to be, oh, you know, it would be a little bit better if I did this or right. if I did that. In fact, I could, I could see someone like starting multiple batches at different times just so and that you always have well. something coming to fruition. Yeah, you know, and starting like with these kits, I think the hardest part is getting consistency, but once mm. you start to get good, then you can start adding like, well, what happens if I put grapefruit rinds in there? <laughs> what if I put apricots in there? You know? And that like, would explain Samuel Adams. Like, yeah, exactly. What happens if we put a dead pumpkin into this thing? <laughs> what would that taste like? <laughs> it's, I think it's going to be terrible, but we're going to do it we're anyway. We're going to try yeah. it anyways. <laughs> uh, uh, so... When you uh, when you want to make another batch, all you have to do is buy more hops, more yeast, and yeah, more just, barley or whatever it might if be. If you right? have one of these kits, they all, they have different varieties of different beers that you would like. So for my Mister Beer Kit, I had um, a red ale, but uh, you can also do IPAs, like they kits for anything. And uh, you know, once you have the equipment, all you have to do is order the little kits. Oh, when I was living in Bolivia, they have this thing called uh, chicha, which is yeah. is basically it's fermented fruit. So oh, it's okay. fruit beer. Huh. It's, so it's really sweet, very disgusting, horrible smelling, <laughs> but incredibly yeah. high percentage of alcohol. So I, that's the main thing. People are like, oh, I get ripped on this. I think I've heard the prisoners no. making yeah. that in it's, toilets. Yeah, no, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's, mm. So when I saw the first time I saw them making this, I'm like, I thought mm. I saw, I think I've seen this on like a Nat Geo special, <laughs> uh, but okay, sure, cultural yeah, heritage, whatever boom. works for you. You know, <laughs> it's you know, in the the alcohol and the fermenting process is a good way of uh, getting rid of germs and things like That's that. That's true. I mean, probably wouldn't have made it out of the Black Plague without, or like it was safer to drink beer than it was water at that point. Actually, uh, there's yeah. a lot of times when I'm overseas where it is safer to drink beer or soda than it is to drink water. <laughs> so that has to stick with your Coca Cola yeah. just to so get super dehydrated. Yeah. Folks, when we come back, uh, Brian's actually going to have a little chit chat with an expert or a couple of experts, people who Home have actually expert. been doing this for a while. Because I'm a beginner level. Yeah. Oh, and I'm, then, I'm way below you. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So then, yeah, we got to step it up to the next level. We will step it up. But before we step it up that way, let's step it up with our audio environment. Now, cool. folks, you you all know what this is like, to, to have a noisy peripheral next to your laptop or your desktop. I mean, that the CD writer, or maybe the, the little uh, utility that you need in order to make your, your, uh, your function work. Well, folks, the old way to get rid of that was to use a long parallel serial extension cable, maybe a couple of extenders to get that accessory away from your computer, away from your desktop, away from your ears. Unfortunately, we don't really have that kind of technology for super high-speed bus transfers. If you're using Thunderbolt or if you're using USB 3, you are kind of limited by the technology. Or at least you were until Corning came by. Now, Corning has given us this. This is their Thunderbolt optical cable. And, well, it's not just a Thunderbolt cable. It's fiber. These are fiber transceivers. Transceivers. They will actually take the standard Thunderbolt signal and then they will turn it into light, which gets beamed through one of Corning's fantastically durable, fantastically fast, fantastically flexible optical cables. Now, these are nearly indestructible. You can bend them, you can fold them, you can tie them into knots and keep your signal integrity. They're incredibly strong, they're incredibly flexible, and they have cable runs of up to 60 meters. That's 200 feet. If you want to use USB 3, you can get 50 meters, 165 feet. That makes it possible to get your space consuming and your noisy accessories away from your work area. I tell you folks, if you're looking for a good way to get acoustic isolation, there is no better way to do it than with Corning. Don't believe me? Well, how about this? Trust Universal Audio. They're a company that deals with high-end audio equipment. They need a perfect sonic environment in order to be able to test that equipment. Well, they can't do it if they've got their peripherals right next to the testing station. So they use optical cables by cording to get all of those noisy bits and pieces far, far away. If a company that depends on acoustic isolation trusts corning, don't you think you should too? 
Instead of investing in multiple extenders, adapters, and cables, turn to optical cables by coining to establish the connection that you need with one simple long length cable. They're available now at all major electronics and professional AV retailers, including Apple stores, Amazon, B&H, and more. If you are looking for acoustic and accessory and bandwidth perfection, you owe it to yourself to try optical cables by Corning. They're longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. And we thank Corning for their support of know-how. All right, so Brian. Sorry, I've made a mess we, of this. We are, uh, <laughs> with that, but you know what? That's that's actually what we do with that. We yeah. make a mess and well, they continue working. The nice thing is, it's fine. Yeah, yeah it still work. <laughs> you just like stepping on them. <laughs> that too. Yeah, that. Uh, we uh, we did decide to pull in a little bit of twit horsepower to to solve this beer thing because that's right. We can both do the technical <laughs> thing. I mean, we know how to follow directions yeah. and then improvise a tiny bit because we don't like to follow the directions, but. Mm -hmm. We have someone who actually has years and years and years of experience <laughs> in brewing beer at home. Not just years and years of experience, but he's gotten to the level where he's bought enough equipment that he, he can make like big batches of beer and then you know treat the rest of the studio with uh, his newest concoction. But uh, we're talking about Russell. And I think it would be easier just to um, do an interview with him and check out his setup at his house. So I'm here with Russell Tammany, uh, our very infamous IT guy. How you doing, Russell? Hey, good, Brian. <laughs> well, I'm glad you came on because I have shown everyone how to do their own um, kind of small scale home brewing with the Mr. Beer Kit. Right. But then the next step, you know, you want to you want to take it to the next notch. And you've been telling me a little bit about the setup that you have at your home, and you've brought along some some pictures and the tools that you use for for your next level of uh, home brewing. Uh, would you mind elaborating on some of the stuff that you use? Yeah, sure. So I decided to start brewing um, probably about three years ago, mm -hmm. um, and instead of starting off with just like a basic kit like the Mister Beer kits and uh, you know some of the extract kits, I decided well. If I'm going to brew beer, I really want to do it the real way because I right. want to make a beer just like I'm used to having from, you know, a brewery around here. Right, right. Uh, so I decided to kind of get into it with a, a full all-grain setup mm -hmm. um, and then went a little overboard in terms of just, you know, <laughs> setting up all the, uh, all the equipment. And, well, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. if, if I do a hobby, I sort of overdo it and mm -hmm. you know, try to I put a lot into it. So um, but one, one of the first things I do uh, when I'm going to brew a beer is I start to kind of prep the whole recipe out. Mm -hmm. um, and I use a piece of software called Beersmith. Right. And um, Beersmith is some software that lets you kind of enter all of the recipe information in. So it lets you put in, um, you know, your grain bill, what kind of malts you're using, uh, what kind of hops, uh, which yeast, um, and even how much water and uh, the type of water and its hardness and all sorts of things like that. And it helps really make all of the calculations um, for things like, uh, your starting volumes and your finishing volumes and what the original gravity should be and kind of a lot of the technical things that, um, you know, would be a little bit harder to calculate out by hand. Right. That makes sense because if you're using a beer kit like I did, everything comes pre-measured. All you need to do is basically add the right amount of water. Right. But if you and want those are, to... Those are sized for like a certain size kit or mm -hmm. for a certain style. Um, and they're usually set up for a certain uh, type of mash if they're even a grain mash at all. Right. So uh, because I was going to be doing like uh, uh, an all grain brew um, and I wanted to be able to pick the volumes and the sizes and not really have to worry about, well, you know, OK, I've got the water at this temperature. When I add the grain, what temperature does it go down to? Because right. temperature control is, is one of the you know, key things in brewing and, <laughs> you know, extracting all the way from from the mash to the to the boil and then you know, even in fermentation. So. Okay. I wanted to be able to, uh, you know, use tools that helped me get to the right uh, temperatures, stay at the right temperatures, and kind of you know right. plan the recipe and stage things out. So. Okay, and I, so doesn't Beersmith have like a forum too? If you wanted yeah. to do certain types of so beer, there's a lot of people who can help you there's out a with whole stuff. Community of recipes, you can download recipes um, into the software. Uh, there's some forums uh, you can download packs if like it doesn't have a particular type of. Uh, grain or, or some ingredient that you have, you can uh, you know download that as like an add-in, okay. and then it it goes in the software. And one of the neat things is once you've built the recipe, you can uh, run it through the mash on this like countdown timer, and so mm -hmm. it'll run through all the steps from uh, from the mash to the end of the mash, uh, the, the temperature holds, 
uh, and then into the brewing schedule where it's like, okay, you're going to bring it to boil. And then at 30 minutes, you're going to add these hops at 60 minutes. You're going to add these hops. Right. And, um, you can play around with those additions and see how it affects the IBU or the bitterness level. Yeah. Um, the color of the, uh, you know, the temperature kind of color of the, uh, of the wart, which will come out in like how dark the beer is. Right. I remember you talking to me this about this a while back and you had mentioned that, um, there have been times where maybe you or, or someone else had made a beer that they really liked, but they didn't keep track of all the ingredients or the steps that they did. Right. And so then they're like, well, guess uh, do, I'll try and make that same beer again, but I might not be able to. Right. And because because those things like temperature and volumes and, and even um, kind of like the hardness of the water, mm-hmm. all of those things can have an effect on the beer. And if you're just kind of winging it and, and getting close, um, you know, it, it if you start with the same recipes and it's, yeah. it's a good quality, it'll probably be pretty close, but it'll be hard to make a consistent result. Right. And I've been able to brew, you know, th- three beers of basically the exact same style or the exact same recipe, and they all came out extremely close to each other, hmm. um, which I consider to be one of the harder things to do. Right. Consistency. The first, the first couple beers I would make, it would be like I'd overshoot the temperature on the mash by 10 degrees and, and kind of over extract it, and it tastes a little bit more... Um, you know, like you you extract the tannins from the from the malt, and then right. it's a little bit more, um, you know, bitter kind of mouthfeel to it. Hmm. So um, all of those things can make a, a pretty big difference in the recipe. Right, and I think another thing that makes a big difference is some of the tools that you might be showing off here. So what, yeah. what's this first one you have? Um, so this is a uh, refractometer. Um, I use it to measure the levels of the sugars, basically in um, in the wort or in the finished product really. Okay. Um, So it measures in bricks and you can use a calculator to convert that to the original gravity. And so that'll tell you basically how much sugar uh, or sugars are in the wort, which is, you know, what you use before you actually make the beer. Right. And that doesn't that tell you how uh, alcoholic the beer will be? Yeah. So it can Mm. help predict basically if you ferment out the fermentable sugars, you know, Mm. what you'll end up at. So I can basically know, okay, well, I should end up at a seven and a half percent beer, um, which you can check later with a hydrometer. Okay. Uh, but uh, it, it'll also sort of tell you, I can check it through the stages and see like, okay, well, I think it's done fermenting. It should be down and around this level. Huh. You can take another sample. And the nice thing about this versus a hydrometer is that um, you can take a, a, a very small sample with a little uh, pipette thing. Yeah. And um, it adjusts for temperature. Uh, it's got a little digital adjustment for that. So... Uh, you don't have to kind of adjust the scale <laughs> or waste a bunch of beer by measuring it in a hydrometer. Right. Um, so that's sort of a neat tool to have. Um, two other little tools I have is a total dissolved solids meter huh. uh, and a pH meter. And so Okay. I know are- what the pH meter is because me and Padre have used those when we've been um, doing the hydroponic stuff, yeah. like balancing our pH. But total, what was the other one? It's, to- it's a total dissolved solids meter. Huh. So it, t- it tells you kind of how many... Uh, solids are almost like minerals are basically in the uh in the water and it's not as good as getting like a real water report yeah um but it does let you tell whether your water is hard or soft and then you can use um, calcium carbonate or gypsum to kind of harden up the water make the water a little more acidic um, for the ph meter hmm. uh, what's your experience with the water here in uh sonoma uh, county yeah i get water from like the city water in oh, okay. uh, santa rosa okay. and then um, i run it through like a three-stage filter and so like one of the things i noticed is that if you test the water before the filters uh, you, i got a pretty high uh, tds like level mm-hmm. it was like somewhere around 480 or 500 ppm and then after the filtration it's about 60. Oh, wow. So the, it showed me that, you know, hey, the filters I have are working. They're taking out quite a bit of, uh, you know, material that's in there. Hmm. And then you can check the pH of the water. And I usually add just a tiny bit of calcium carbonate um, to, to make the water a little more acidic for the mash, which uh, can okay. help with the extraction. Because the, the efficiency of your extraction doesn't necessarily matter a huge ton as a, as a home brewer because it's sort of something you would use to save ingredients or, or to use less um, in the first place, but mm-hmm. it, it helps dial it in. Cause if you're looking to try to get a certain level of sugars in your, in your ward or certain right. extraction from the grain, um, you know, you want to hit that and not be under or over, um, cause you might make a different beer. I I've, you know, I've underestimated my efficiency <laughs> of my setup a couple of times yeah. and ended up making something that was almost a full percent higher alcohol than I intended to. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, wow. That's a pretty big difference then. Which, which is a big difference. And some of that is like grain, you know, how, how the grain's milled, if, <laughs> if it's crushed too much or not crushed too much and, yeah. and all of that. So what's um, the next one you have there? I used a bunch of these little digital thermometers and the whole process of um, measuring the, the mash and measuring the boil and, um, you know, they're, they're really easy to sanitize and, and then wipe and, and they take instant reading. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really useful to have some, some sort of digital thermometer. Um, also I use, um, like nitrile gloves, um, not in the mash. Like there's only, there's a really short period of time kind of like where you're done with the boil and mm -hmm. you're starting to transfer things to fermentation where, you know, you, you don't want to contaminate the beer and so right. um, if I'm opening up a fermenter or you know kind of affecting the beer in any way where uh, you know it's kind of in the danger zone I'll usually yeah. wear some sort of gloves. Have you ever had a beer that went wrong that so got far, contaminated? So no? far I've never had a, a beer go bad <laughs> so I've, I've I've made a couple of accidentally over dry hopped beers hmm. where I was just lazy and left it in for, I couldn't remember when I put it in, <laughs> left the hops in the, in the beer a little too long and yeah. made it a little bit too, uh, too hoppy and crazy. But, okay. um, but so far I've never had an infection and, you know, I, I attribute that to proper sanitation and cleaning and, right. um, you know, I, I'm sort of, I'll, I'll overdo it in, in that way. Right. Um, so this, uh, this is something that I use at the very beginning uh, of the beer making process, which is a, uh, it's a stir plate and then a two liter Erlenmeyer flask. Oh, uh, okay. And so, um, for like a smaller kit or for a lower alcohol beer, it's not necessarily needed to, uh, to make a starter. You can mm -hmm. usually just open the pack of yeast and if it's dry yeast, mix it with water and yeah. So what, what did you do in your kit? Was so it? for the Mr. Beer kit, um, you, you put the, the wort into the fermenter and then because i was doing a red ale the yeast that came in the little packet you know right. just so you got a dry yeast packet. dry yeast packet and um varying on which kind of brew you're trying to do for this one they said just pour it in and don't stir it just let it sit on top just pour it and dry yeah mm -hmm. so that you know probably was maybe what a five percent i think beer or something by the end of it it said 6.2 okay. but okay we'll see yeah, and that and that can you know that can work out. Um, one of the things with these higher beers, so one of the reasons you would do a starter is because the packets or the or the vials usually have about 100 to 150 billion um, viable yeast cells. Yeah, and so f depending on the volume of beer you're making and the and the sugar content, um, it helps to start with you know a, a really healthy large quantity of, of right. yeast that are all happy and ready to, to do an active <laughs> fermentation. Get them happy. Um, yeah. yeah, they have to be happy especially when you're going to, you know, get them drunk on a bunch of sugar. Right. <laughs> right, um, that makes sense. If you're going to make something like a like I've made a couple 9 and 10% beers and if you're going to make Whoa. something that strong and you just put in a packet of dry yeast like that, yeah. it's highly likely to just stall out and you'll be left with like a partial fermentation and It'll be a sweet beer, a very, very sweet beer that's only two or three percent or four percent because it, it just stalls out. It doesn't have the, hmm. the viable replicated yeast to, to do that. Yeah, I'm curious to know what my beer tastes like finally because when, um, you know, because you want to check on it every day. So after a couple of days, I looked at it and it looked like it had kind of um, a foam on the top yeah, it'll get and what some. They call, uh, Krausen. Yeah, and so it looked like there's some just floating on top of that, and I was like, I don't know if they are just clumped up and they got stuck on the foam, or if they were yeah, actually make, fermenting. Um, I think they call them yeast rafts or something. Yeah, like they'll make yeah. little like floater things. <laughs> like, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look very pretty. No. It's, it's, it's fascinating like, though. This is this is weird. Like, why would you drink this after after all that? I don't, yeah, but uh, I, it's interesting to observe the, them progress. But yeah, I just poured it on top, so I never even thought to uh, kind of get them happy before I threw yeah. them in there. So the so a starter basically lets that happen. So okay. what I do is I, I'll add the yeast with some um, uh, usually dry malt extract um, uh, and uh, you know kind of let the yeast ferment out and grow and replicate. And the stir plate kind of activates them better, gets the oxygen kind of flowing and, and yeah. allows them to replicate and kind of uh, uh, you know, grow okay. essentially. And then you can decant off, you know, so I run that usually overnight the night. Hmm. And you see a big difference uh, as they huge, start to... a huge difference. Yeah. Like the fermentation starts almost immediately. <laughs> um, it doesn't take a couple of days before the airlock starts bubbling. It'll just go immediately. And then wow. it, it makes a nice clean... Um, I, it, I think it makes a better final beer, but hmm. um, I don't think it's entirely necessary. And it's sort of... You know, I'm not entirely sure if it's necessary for a, 
um, like a smaller alcohol beer or not. But now that I've, yeah. now I mean, I have the equipment to do it. It doesn't hurt. Um, you know, sometimes if you order like a liquid yeast, it might be old. Uh, and okay. So you, you know, when the liquid yeast was new, it had a hundred billion cells, but you know, after six weeks or eight weeks or something, you know, maybe it got shipped to you across the country, maybe it got right. warm and some stuff died. So I don't want to risk, you know, going through a brew day, going mm-hmm. to add the yeast and then finding out that it's a dud <laughs> or getting a stalled fermentation or, or something right. like that. So this kind of lets me take the yeast that I'm going to use um, and, and grow it. And then it's also helpful for capturing yeast, um, you know, afterwards. So you can take some yeast from, mm. you know, you don't need to ever buy it again, really. If you, if you take some of what uh, you used in your beer. Yeah you'll have a very small amount, but you can kind of step it up and, and kind of grow it. Oh, that's uh, cool. And then, you know, keep it alive and put it in the fridge to kind of make it dormant. And then you can bring it back out a couple of weeks later and use it again. <laughs> that's interesting. So it's like your your own little colony that you kind of hang on to. Yeah, yeah that's very neat. Yeah, and then um, this isn't really in a, in a particular order of how I go through the brew day here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is my conical fermenter. Uh, it's about a 10, 10 and a half gallon um, unit, I believe. And, um, uh, this is what I put all of the wart in afterwards. Um, and then it goes into a temperature controlled refrigerator in my garage. And so, depending on the beers depends on what temperature you keep it at, yeah, I guess. So, so that I can control the fermentation temperature. Um, mm-hmm. it's got a little temperature probe section in it. And, um, and then it's also got, um, the ability to kind of drain off yeast from the bottom or take a sample out the side. Oh, um, without cool. actually opening it or, or, or getting it kind of, um, you know, exposed to anything. Yeah. How much um, does something like that cost? I think it was around $300. Okay. That's not, not, sure. it not wasn't that bad. It looks nice though. But yeah, it was, um, I don't remember which company made it, but it's got all the uh, uh, clover triclamp fittings and all the stuff that like larger brewery equipment has. Um, and uh, because it's stainless, it's really super easy to clean and disinfect and, and not worry about, you know, things left over in a scratch in the plastic or something like right. that. Right. And it's not glass, so you don't have to worry about dropping it and, and mm-hmm. shattering it everywhere, which is another... I like, thing. too, that it's off the ground. So if you... Do you use that for bottling or do um, you transfer to another... Yeah, I, I transfer yeah. it out. So I, I have a, a keg set up. So yeah. I'll transfer it directly to a keg. Ah, uh, okay. But um, I only do a, a kind of like what they call primary, primary fermentation. Okay. So I don't really transfer it to a secondary. I've found that with the, especially with the conical, that everything just settles out into a little cone at the bottom, and then mm-hmm. you can take out of a side tap and nice and leave it all alone. And it it actually helps with uh, filtration and stuff too. Um, I have a brew kettle. Uh, I think it's seven gallons or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, but I still brew on the stove. So right. So it still takes size, a long time. It takes a long time yeah. to get the water, <laughs> and uh, and that's probably the worst thing. I. I I really need to get one of the um, kind of rapid boil propane burners and then set up a little stand in the garage or something and, mm-hmm. and just do it in the garage instead because it'll take a good, you know, two to three hours while you're just waiting for, for water to get up to temperature, particularly doing, you know, a mash and then and then the brew. So, um, but, you know, it's still possible to do it on your, on your kitchen counter if you've got a high output um, uh, gas burner, which I do have. So it's, it's pretty good, but it's nothing like the you know, powerful propane things. And, right. Um, the nice thing is, is that by doing it on the stove, it's a lot easier to control the temperature. Um, and so what I have here is um, a stainless mash ton that I do a temperature mash with. And so this is one of the things that Bruce Smith helps me with is to make sure I'm getting the temperatures right. Um, because instead of taking all of the grain and water and getting it to a certain temperature and then putting it in like an igloo cooler or something to, uh, which is what's usually used as the cheaper way to do an extraction. Mm-hmm. This is actually bringing it up to a certain temperature, and then um, you can bring it up to a, a final temperature and then bring it back down again. Um, mm. And c- you control that basically just with the gas. And so, at this point, at this stage of the brewing process, why is the temperature super key? So this is for, for extracting the right sugars and fermentable sugars out of the grains. Like you crush uh, the grain okay. and you mix the grain in the water. And you've got a whole, I think it's usually, I think I usually do 151 degrees for, I, I can't remember, it's like 10, 15 minutes or something. Uh, and, okay. Uh, and then you bring it up to like 161 or something for five minutes. And if you overshoot it, you can end up with more bitter stuff. Or if you undershoot it, you get less extraction. Hmm. Um, and then this is also set up for recirculation. 
So there's a uh, there's an output at the bottom and then another input at the top. Oh yeah. And you can set a pump up in between this, and then you can pump uh, out of the false bottom. You can see that there's a false bottom in the bottom of it. Oh cool. And so the the grain and water all kind of sit on top of this. Yeah. And then uh, you know it it'll drain through, and then to increase the efficiency and and to make sure that all the stuff's been circulated, you can kind of stir it around, um, but you can also recirculate it. Oh okay. And so that kind of helps uh, extract even more. Uh, and and let you use basically less right uh, less grain or get a higher alcohol content out of the same grain. Very cool. And so what's this one you've got here? Uh, this here is an immersion cooler. And so once you're done with the boil, uh, and you know, you, so you've you've done the boil, and now you need to transfer it to the fermenter and mm -hmm. um, put the yeast in, so it can start. Um, it's not a good idea to put the yeast in when it's any higher than you know maybe. 78 80 something degrees um you know each yeast is sort of different but mm. you know definitely if you just throw the yeast into 100 something degree they kill them thing, or it'll, it'll boil kill them basically yeah, <laughs> just cook them. nothing will ever happen yeah and, and, it'd be uh, like a jedi moment where yeah. you get like i feel something in the force yeah. yeah and so um you know you can just um i have so one of the times before i tried well let me just I'll put it all in the fermenter. I won't run through all of the uh, the stuff I need to to do the immersion cooler, and then I'll just set my fridge down to what I want it to be and, and let it cool it down. Okay. So I, I did that, put it in there overnight. Next day, it's still like a hundred something degrees because <laughs> it's just it was too it's too much energy to cool by itself. Right. When, when you have like six or seven gallons of of hundred and eighty something degree uh, beer wort or you know yeah. plus two twelve. So um, it can take quite a long time to cool down. And then, you know, it's really best to just get it down to temperature, get it transferred, and then um, get it starting on its way fermenting because it just it takes less time. And, right. You know, you're less likely to get any sort of infection. Well, and so uh, when not with the little kit that I used, but some friends and I made some beer, and what we ended up doing was basically putting it in a bathtub full of ice to try and cool it down, and it's not really the best way to try and temp it's, it's like gauge lot. the temperature yeah, and stuff. It's a lot to try to, to bring it down, and then you have yeah. to kind of keep checking the temperature. You know, maybe if you stir the ice around it, you know, that can help. But Right, and you can never be 100% sure if the temperature you're getting is right because the edges will be a little bit cooler, but the center will still be pretty warm unless you circulate it in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So this, this is something, there there are some other kind of ways of, of cooling it, but this is one of the common, cheaper ways of, of uh, cooling things. And mm -hmm. you just run a hose basically into it. and, and Right. Like, it's, it's like a radiator or water cooled. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it will get down from a, you know, pretty hot temperature, you know, almost 200 degrees down to maybe 100, 105 or something in about 15 minutes. Oh, that's not bad at all. Yeah. Um, maybe even a little less. <laughs> it takes a long time. If you really want to get it down to, you know, in the 70s, Obviously, if your water is warmer than that, it's not going to. Right. But the the, <laughs> the less of a difference there is between the, the your water and the um, and like the wort temperature, it, it's just going to take longer and longer to cool it. Right. So, right. Um, so you, I usually stop after it gets you know in the in the nineties or something, and then by the time you transfer it, I, I have a little I don't have a picture of it, but I have an aerator, and so when I transfer it into the um, into the fermenter, mm -hmm. I pipe it through a uh, an aerator, which kind of fans out the the wort, which lets it kind of get oxygenated. It helps it cool a little bit, hmm. um, and then by creating a little bit of oxygen in the in the beer at that time, um, you know, it helps the yeast kind of be a little happier. Oh, or okay. Uh, this is just a picture of a whole bucket full of. Uh, clamps and uh, <laughs> uh ball valves and things like that those that look pretty heavy duty yeah, you, yeah this is basically the same stuff that they use in a in a small production brewery okay do you uh, find a lot of this equipment did you get it off craigslist or ebay uh, or is there a supply store yeah, that you I go to I got some of it from um you know usually like online places yeah. like northern brewer or midwest brewing supplies um some of it's just from Amazon. Okay. Um, I'm actually not a huge fan of ball valves, yeah. um, particularly because they're a real pain to clean. <laughs> um, and you really have to clean them after every time you use them. Mm -hmm. And then if you if you get different manufacturers or different brands and things like that, and then, um, you know, you take them apart, put them back together, and and maybe you put the, uh, the output side from another one on another one, and, like, you get them mixed around. I found that they'll drip or leak sometimes. Right. And there's nothing worse than like going back out to your fermenter and finding that it's just dripping your <laughs> a beer giant out. puddle, it's just dripping your beer out. <sighs> yeah, that and would now be now it's in there, and now you can't remove the whole thing. 
So you just have to take <laughs> another one and put another one on on the end of it. So now you got two ball valves <laughs> attached to each other. Uh, yeah, that that does not um, sound like the optimal way. But they way. make butterfly valves, which I have a couple of too, which uh, are super easy to clean. Okay. Um, but they're a little heavier duty and and more expensive. So I didn't I didn't really have many of them. Uh, this is a grain mill, mm -hmm. and so I use this in conjunction with um, uh, just a power drill like a, a plugged in power drill it yeah. it burned up uh, a cordless drill so uh, <laughs> it's uh, not a good idea to use a cordless drill to crush okay. grain but and so um, what do you do with this so what you do with this is you can you kind of shim you can set the uh, the width of it so that you can set the right kind of crush like whether you want a finer crush or a coarser crush oh, okay um, and uh, i have little shim kits and stuff that you can use to measure that hmm. and then you just put the drill on it and then you take the grain uh, which hasn't been crushed. Right. And you add the grain to it and crush it all into usually like a little plastic bucket or something. Okay. And the point of crushing it is to op open well, it up and then yeah, that's you, how the so sugar you, yeah, and stuff gets out. Yeah, if you were to just out. take the grain with it, with it not being crushed, you wouldn't yeah. be able to extract almost any sugars out of it. Right. Um, and so you really want to crush it into not so fine. If, if you crush it too fine um, and then you put it in like a, a, a mash tun or you're trying to extract stuff out of it, it yeah. can turn too kind of gloopy and... And it, it won't uh, flow well, and it'll clog up that that mash tun bottom. Uh, and instead okay. of getting you know like kind of like free flow of like water through the grain, right? You, you've just got like a big oatmeal soup hmm. pot, and then you'll have too many fine particles in the uh, in the beer that'll be harder to filter out, and and so like you don't want to over crush it, um, but you don't really want to under crush it either, and and you know usually. If you're just getting into doing all grain stuff or doing like a brew in a bag, you really, you know, the places that you can buy grain from, mm -hmm. you know, you can have them crush for you. Is there any, um, if they crush for you, do you lose like freshness if you don't use it right away? Or is that I why you know. crush I, your own? I don't know if it matters as yeah. much. I mean, you just maybe. wanted to do it, it on it just, your own. It just feels better. Yeah. To, to do it that way. <laughs> it uh, smells good. It smells good. It, yeah. it, it gives you a little more control over the process and in, in mixing in other grains and stuff too. Okay. Um, you know, if, and then it also lets you do something like buy a 50 pound bag of a base kind of two row malt or something. And then just order the specialty grains, you know, a little bit at a time. Um, and you can stockpile the uncrushed grain for significantly longer. Okay. Um, I don't know how long you can keep around um, the crushed grain, but I imagine it goes stale or absorbs f off flavors or sort of, you know, it's kind of like that open box of cereal. Right? So, <laughs> you know, the open box right. of cereal is fine for a while, but... Right. You know, if it's been six months, it's probably not fine anymore. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good analysis. So um, what's that? This is just looking into the to the grain oh, okay. mill. So it, it, it has this kind of conical shape, so it just funnels the little stuff down. Right, and you have it's a little shim little rollers to open in there. It. Oh, okay. Um, and then, the, yeah, there's the, the gap between the rollers that you set. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can sort of it, – it's hard to really dial in the, the crush. So I've sort of, you know, done a little research online of, like, what – Typically, people set the mills up for and just kind of set it to that. And mm -hmm. I don't really play with it too much, but I do check it before I start just to make sure it hasn't gone all over the place. Um, these are a couple of the things from my pile of chemicals <laughs> and other additives and things. Um, on the left, I have the Irish moss, which can be used um, uh, when you add it in around the end of the boil. It helps kind of... Um, uh, flocculate the the yeast out um, hmm. make the beer a little clearer and cleaner um so like a lot of people will add irish moss around the end of the brew to kind of help settle things out hmm. um the iodine tincture i think i don't even remember why i have that i think i have it for for yeast staining or something like that for like taking samples of yeast and then Oh. Staining them for something. Like, I don't exactly remember why. I have it. You sort of collect these things I sort as you of go collecting along. Collecting these yeah. things, like you know, I didn't get them all together for one thing, but yeah. um, uh, there's yeast nutrient which can help the yeast grow. I usually add a little bit of the yeast nutrient to the starter. Mm -hmm. um, the potassium metabisulfate is something to to actually kill yeast, um, and so I've used that in making sweet ciders. So I'll make a cider, and then if you normally let the yeast fully ferment out, oh, they'll yeah. take all of the uh, uh, the sugars and turn them into alcohol, and they right. end up with a dry cider that's not sweet. And if you try to add sugar back to it, 
then the yeast will start up again and try to try to eat the shit. You know, like they're gonna like try to help you out. <laughs> okay, so you put that so in and I it put kills the, the yeast. Put the metabisulfate in and it kills the yeast. There's also some potassium sorbate I think behind it, which is another thing that's used to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps kind of kill them. And then you can add the sugar back and it won't start back up again. Okay, and keeps it sweet. Yeah, and I think there's more yeast nutrient there. And then there's something called polyclar, which is a uh, kind of plastic based clarifier. And so it's like a it's like a white fine powder. Mm -hmm. If you stir that in at the end of the fermentation, uh, it'll kind of bond and attach to any of the floating yeast or hot particles and things like that uh, and okay. help settle them out. Um, it's not necessarily the most natural thing, but right. a lot of breweries actually use stuff like that for cleaning or they'll use, um, you know, uh, filtration systems and things like that, uh, okay. right tanks and filtration systems. Do you have to be worried about ingesting that? No, or? it's... it's safe to ingest a little bit. <laughs> Quotation you know, it's, marks, yeah. It's, you know, I still run things. You, you basically still cold crash the beer and, and yeah. bring it down to a really low temperature at the end of the fermentation, which helps settle things out. Uh, okay. Um, so because I have the ability to do that in the in the fridge system I have, you know, I can set it down to like 33 degrees right before I'm ready to keg it. Okay. And then that helps drop everything out. You know, I can stir in some polyclar or if you want to use something like gelatin, hmm. um, you can mix up some gelatin, just regular plain gelatin not jello right jello right it like <laughs> jello. right you just wanted to uh, grab the particles but, but that'll kind of help bring things out make it as clear as you can without buying like a commercial filtration system got it which i'm probably going to do next that's one of the, <laughs> one of the things i don't have is, that's is the next investment yeah. um, i didn't really want to deal with the extra hosing and piping and pumping and cleaning the plates and then you know if you don't use the um filters once you use the filters they get kind of dirty and then they can start to get moldy if you you know don't keep them um, kind of sterile and things makes like that. sense so it's, it's sort of hard um, these are just a bag of calcium carbonate and gypsum um, calcium carbonate will lower acidity and make the water a little harder and gypsum will um, raise the acidity and make the water a little harder okay okay um, so good to so have on it's hand sort of, it's sort of you know if you know where about your water is and i know where about my water is um, from the city's water report. Um, you know, you can take your water and send it off to be analyzed, or, or usually you can, you know, check with your city or water supplier, and they may have like an annual water report that tells you, you know, here's what you have for calcium, here's what you hmm. have for iron. Um, you know, and there's some things that are not, you know, desirable in beer. Um, the other thing is if you start with something like reverse osmosis water or distilled water, yeah, you have to add some some hardness back to it you can't just take distilled water because the yeast won't much. grow in it right um, or i think the yeast the yeast would probably still be okay but you, oh, okay the extraction there's not a lot of kind of elemental nutrients for them so i don't think it's uh. as good for the yeast but also um there's something about extracting the sugars from the, the grain that like it's just not it doesn't work right without the right kind of hardness and ph of the water okay and, uh, mm -hmm. distilled water is a little too pure to of help that process so um i have some of the uh the cleaning and disinfecting chemicals and stuff which i have a whole pile of <laughs> the uh important ones are basically star sand for a sanitizer mm -hmm. um you mix it up um in like a little spray bottle and you can use it to spray things down and it's a, it's a no rinse sanitizer and it's safe to drink and it's safe to to get into you know any of the products so right so like before i'll uh you know put stuff into the the fermenter I'll just spray the whole fermenter down with star sand and then dump it out at the bottom right before I put the beer in. And you don't wipe it, you don't rinse it. Because you know, that would just be introducing you some be way introducing of something else yeah, into it. Yeah. So it's um, it's just like a like a low acid kind of sanitizer, um, which I basically use on absolutely everything yeah. you know that comes in contact with the with the beer. Right. You know, especially in its final kind of ready to ferment kind of form. Good to know. Um, and then Santa Clean is. Um, a cleaner which is not safe to to drink um or you don't really you basically <laughs> want to rinse it after right so do you use that on tools or anything yeah, like so that I'll, yeah i'll soak the um the ball valves in that mm -hmm. um you know you can use that in the kegs um and then pbw um which is like a powdered brewer's wash is, is in the back and that's that's another good cleaner for things that um <laughs> you know you can kind of soak things in and then scrub things with um you can use i think um like oxyclean free Oh. Uh, not the not the scented kind, but like the, the uh, unscented kind is pretty similar. Okay. Um, but the PBW stuff rinses really nicely and and doesn't seem to leave as much of a film. So good to know. Um, 
But you know, when you if you're just using like a small kit, uh, you know, with a, a plastic kind of carboy or something, like as long as you really rinse it out and really keep it clean and use some sort of sanitizer on it, yeah, um, it's probably okay. But the Mister Beer kit I I got came with a no rinse or the cleanser, you know, so you wash it out and then you dump it and that's it. Like, don't yeah. put anything else in there. Yeah, and so for but for some of the heavy like the the once you get the um, fermentation going and it kind of that krausen comes up on the side and then it falls back down it'll kind of glue itself to the outside of the fermenter uh, and it gets like really stuck on there and it's really ew. kind of grimy and gritty and sticky and so if you're not like cleaning it off with something that's pretty powerful it won't necessarily get out of there and when you want it in the little nooks and crannies and the valves and things like that oh, it's, yeah. it's better to just kind of use a, a powerful cleaner okay um, and I have a whole pile of just different diameter hose and tubing and vinyl tubing and silicone tubing because all the different um, – uh, I have different nipple ad adjustments for, like, transferring things into a pump or out of a pump or kind of back into the uh, uh, fermenter or out of the uh, brew kettle. And so I'm, I'm always using hoses basically to transfer things. Right. Um, instead of trying to pour them into a bucket and pour them around or, or kind of, you know – mix them all over the place so, yeah um uh using tubing and hoses to transfer things just seemed like a nicer way to do it and and mm -hmm. th that way i didn't need extra containers and things like that so, when i i was worried when i was transferring the wart in the um the big pot that i had mixed everything together i then had to pour it into the little uh fermenter and like over the sink is what i did and it uh i had to be really careful not to miss the edge and then spill it over the, yeah. the side and everything so yeah it would be a lot easier if there's just a hose that i could clamp on yeah so i've got a couple other things here um there's a uh, uh, this stuff called firm cap s mm -hmm. and so it's something that you can put in the boil and um when you're boiling with hops and things like that, it helps to stop it from boiling over. So it kind <laughs> of breaks up the surface tension in the boil and um, stops it from potentially kind of just bubbling up and kind of foaming and, and bubbling over. Um, and then it's also useful, um, which is part, why it's part of the name, in fermentation, because if you put a drop or two of it in, uh, in there uh, kind of before the fermentation starts or as you're transferring things, yeah. um, when that Krausen starts, when it starts to... Uh, uh, you know, kind of lift the yeast and everything up at the top when it's fermenting. Right. This actually breaks up all that surface tension and stops it from doing that very much. Okay. So does that help with just the cleaning so process then later? Or? It, it mainly is just a kind of like an aesthetics thing really. Mm. But um, what I found is that in my fermenter, when I'm doing a pretty big batch, um, you know, when it's like near the top, it can pretty easily get, you know, four or five, six inches above the actual level of the wart in there. Wow. And that can be, you know, if, if you've got it pretty full, that can be up and over and out the top. And yeah. so what happens is it'll kind of like spurt up out of the uh, out of the top and either go through your airlock and just start spewing things out your airlock. Um, or you have a little blow off tube that's, you know, run into a bottle of sanitizer or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it'll just start kind of going out and up the tube and just kind of spill all over the place. Okay. So you can kind of keep it in control um, with a blow off tube and, and something like that. But um, I found the firm cap stuff works really well to kind of keep that stuff down. Um, and I think I've got uh, lactic acid there, which I actually used, uh, I think, when I was brewing sake. I don't think I've used it for beer yet. Yeah, and not to diverge too much, but sake was kind of a pain, right? Sake was a real pain. Sake, <laughs> is, sake is like two months of touching it every other day. Right. Um, you know, having to do something. Um, you know, every other day for at least a month and a half and then, you know, every week for another month or so. And it takes a very long time. It took about, you know, almost six months from start to finish. Um, you know, and, and I made essentially cheap crappy taste. <laughs> like the, it was, it was sake, but yeah. it, you know, it wasn't really uh, you know, super great or anything, but. Right. Whereas with beer, it's kind of an intense process one day and then. Yeah. Boom. It's so much easier to do beer. I, I don't know if I'm going to, I have all the stuff I need to do sake again, but I don't know if, uh, I'll do that again <laughs> just because it was quite the process. So um, this is a, a transfer pump that I have. Um, it's rigged up on a, on a little board uh, with a remote uh, control start and stop for the motor. Okay. Um, that way I don't have to get somebody else to turn it on and off and I can, I can turn it on and off like at the end instead of, uh, uh, you know, having to run back over and switch it off or spilling something. So, 
um, it's set up for that, and uh, it lets me do that recirculation transfer. So oh, okay, mash ton, cool. you can hook it up, kind of recirculate everything um, from the bottom of the mash tun to the top. You can then use it to transfer things from the mash tun to the brew kettle, to transfer things from the brew kettle to the fermenter, and then transfer things from the fermenter to the keg. Okay, cool. Um, and then I've also got a filter screen for it too. Um, and so you can run things through these uh, filter screens and to try to filter out any of the larger particles and things like that. Um, and this is a shot of the uh, fermentation fridge that I have all set up. Um, I modified a uh, used commercial refrigerator um, and was able to use the uh, internal wiring in the refrigerator for its light and door circuits and stuff um, to run a heating circuit and then to cut into the cooling circuit um, without really modifying or drilling into it um, in any way. So I've got a controller to set the temperature for when the compressor comes on to make it cold. Wow. And then I've also got a setting for uh, like a 200-watt panel heater that's also inside the fridge. Okay. And so I, I put that in there with the uh, with the fermenter, and it basically lets me pick a temperature and set it. Oh. Um, and then I've also got a programmable brew bit, which will let me set advanced programming things for, you know, like keep a certain temperature for this amount of time and then change it or check the temperature remotely. Um, but I found that it's actually rather unstable. It was a it was a Kickstarter project. Oh, it didn't ago. work out very well. It, it doesn't really work out very well. So I, after I found it locked up once or twice, <laughs> not doing anything other than leaving it in whatever state it was in, oh, that's too I, just, bad. I don't really trust it in, enough to to keep using it. But it was okay. a it was a neat project. But it's probably better to use something like a Raspberry Pi because um, there's some software called Brew Pi mm -hmm. that lets you kind of do the same thing with temperature control. Have you uh, played with that yet? I haven't played with it yet, but it's what I would basically replace this with. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and then I also usually keep my notes of my brew um, just with like wet erase pen on the actual door of it. So I know the last thing I brewed when I started, um, you know, when I check on things, when I was going to dry hop things, just kind of keep a, a way to, you know, log when things were done or when things need to be done. Um, and then I'll usually go back and enter that into to Brewsmith at the end of the, the note so that mm -hmm. next time I can pull it up and see, well, you know, this is when I did this and this is when I did that. So, um, and then I've got a kegerator. This is my uh, uh, kind of tap handles for the three things that I had on uh, on tap. Um, and then inside the kegerator, I've got three kegs and then a big uh, uh, CO2 tank in the back, which you can't see. But yeah, um, basically I transfer. So once the fermentation is all done, I'll transfer it out into the keg. Right. And then um, put it under uh, CO2 pressure. And so I don't need to add any bottling sugar. I don't need to wait for it to kind of uh, ferment out again um, to, to get the carbonation. Hmm. You just put it in the keg and then turn the pressure back up. And uh, you can turn it up higher for two or three days yeah. and turn it back down again to like the regular serving pressure. Um, but um, it, it lets you drink the beer a little sooner. Um, and it's a lot nicer than washing and sanitizing and cleaning and bottling like 50 or 60 bottles. Right. Um, right. You know, even though I have the ability to do that and I have some bottles and bottle capper, it's just a lot nicer to put it in the keg and, and, you know, then things will settle out. Usually the first pint out of the keg will be a little cloudy. Um, and then everything else after that is, is fine. So. And how big are those tanks? Those are five gallon, uh, five. uh, corny kegs. Uh, and they have a ball lock, uh, you know, taps on them and stuff. Um, one of the things that was sort of important was getting the the line length and pressure and all that stuff right. Because it was, at first, I didn't realize that you needed a particular <laughs> resistance or length in there. And mm -hmm. So um, I had too short of lines. And so that ended up making like really foamy beer. So uh, like you try to pull a, a pint and it would just end up foaming foam. all over the place. And then if you turn the uh, pressure down, uh, it'll come out without foaming, but then your beer gets slowly decarbonated and, and, you know, is flat again. Right. So you have to balance the kind of pressure and the line length and, <laughs> you know, what you're going to get in the, in the keg. Um, so, um, I've, yeah, I've also got this bottling, uh, caps and a little, little bottling thing to, uh, to bottle some beer with, but nice. But yeah, so that's, um, that pretty much that's everything. The end product, you know, you, yeah. you, you can go from, uh, you know, crushing the grain, you, you go from kind of making the starter, crushing the grain, um, you know, something like that at first to, you know, doing the mash where you're getting the sugars out into the wort, doing the boil, adding the hops, 
cooling it down, transferring it to the fermenter, adding the yeast, letting it ferment out, and you know, wait a couple weeks and then uh, <laughs> transfer it into the keg, and uh, then you can carbonate it and drink it. So <laughs> very cool. Well, uh, thanks a lot for showing me all that. It's definitely uh, a lot more sophisticated than the beer kit I used, which took me about an hour to do, but I doubt that the results will be anywhere near as good or repli like I could replicate the process, you know, as well as you have with this setup. But also, um, I'm going to be doing a brewery tour and I look forward to seeing how well this small setup that you have kind of scales into like a large brewery setup. Cause it seems like you basically do what a brewery does, but just on a like five to 10 gallon scale yeah, instead of like a huge vat. It's like a smaller scale. And so it, it's a little easier to do things like moving the stuff around. You know, you'll find in the larger breweries that they'll, you know, they'll have a hot liquor tank for the mash to keep water at the right temperature already. And um, there's a lot more transfer pipes and tubing and, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff around to move everything around. Right. But right. It's, it's essentially the same process. Um, they'll use a really nice thing on their fermenters, which are uh, glycol jacketed. <laughs> so they, instead of them putting it inside a refrigerator, which obviously, you know, you're going to get a really big refrigerator and it's not very efficient right. to use a refrigerator. Um, they'll run inside the, the fermenter will be like a double walled fermenter hmm. and they'll run lines with um, glycol or some sort of um, kind of coolant. And acts like it. a giant and refrigerator. And that's what they cool, they <laughs> cool the liquid and then pump the cooled liquid through it and then that keeps the right temperature. Very cool. So, um, or, so or, it's not, it's not, you know, full scale, but uh, right. I wanted to do something that would let me get you know, <laughs> good results and, and be replicable. And uh, if I were to compare it to baseball, what I did was little league uh, I'd say you're probably like triple A and then like a, you know, a big brewery's, uh, the pros like MLB or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there's, right. there's some setups that go from, you know, just a couple, like a couple barrel sizes all the way up to like the, you know, huge multi-story level from <laughs> and tanks and stuff. So there, there's a lot of breweries doing, um, stuff in smaller kind of setups that you could probably do at home if you wanted to dedicate your whole garage to it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a few people out there that want to sure do that. I'm sure there's some people that, that have that going on. Uh, well, folks, that's Russell Tammany, our resident IT guy. Russell, if people want to find out more about what you're doing or follow you online, is there anywhere they should go to? Um, my Twitter is just at expose, E-X-P-H-O-S-E. Cool, cool. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on, yeah. showing us your brew stuff. And uh, maybe now folks out there will want to step it up a notch. So do you have any ideas of your next batch of beer? Now that you've got Russell's wisdom, <laughs> how is it going to change what you do with uh, your next gallon of ale? You know, I'll probably, I, I want to do an IPA and I'm definitely going to stick with my little kit for a little bit longer yeah. until I get, you know, because the equipment Russell has is, yeah, is nice, but it's, it's also expensive. very expensive, yeah. but he's on a whole nother level. But uh, I'll probably do like an IPA is the next one I want to try with my little beer kit. But that's true no matter what your hobby might be. I mean, you can always go a little overboard with the equipment. I know I did when we were doing quadcopters. I know I did when we did Grow How. I, basically, every project we've ever done on Know How, I've gone way overboard. It uh, escalates. It escalates. Yeah, and, you know, you're like, you know what, this, this works fine. But if I got that, <laughs> that thing that costs 10 times more than this thing, I bet it would be better. Yeah, especially like when you were uh, getting different remotes for the quadcopters, oh, right. <laughs> and then I would get your your hand me downs. Yeah. And I'm like, well, actually, I have this one now. <laughs> Congratulations, Brian! You just got my old busted up controller. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly. Bad. It was a good excuse to upgrade. So yeah, maybe maybe I'll give Alex my old beer kit, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll upgrade to another one. I don't know. Alex seems to me more like the just the, he wants to grow, drink the beer, not grow the beer. I think so. Not, not yeah, and he's kind of a Scotch guy, but I don't think they make do it. You're self scotch kits uh, and you'd have yeah. to wait a really long time so i know they have do-it-yourself moonshine kits but i'm pretty sure that's still illegal yeah i don't think so. i don't think you're supposed to but it is uh it was 1978 was the year that jimmy carter signed a bill that let people grow, uh, brew beer at home because they had not been doing it before before that ever right no one had ever tried doing that 
<laughs> Legally. <laughs> now, what do you have planned for the folks in the next episode? Because we're doing a two-parter. This was sort of introduction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You showed off the kits that you're using. You uh, you had a little chit-chat with Russell. And we do the magic of production. There's a little bit of time lapsing going on here. Yes. But, uh, six weeks will elapse in the next <laughs> three days. And then we will, we will taste the beers at the end of the show. So the main thing for the next episode is I'm... Through my adventures of beer tasting, I've made a lot of friends in the beer industry, ah. and I'm going to be going to Third Street Brewery <gasps> in Santa Rosa and getting the full tour of nice. all the equipment they use. So we're going from what it's like to build uh, just to start doing beer, and then you know the next level when you start to get really into it, like Russell, and then finally the industrial level uh, with the full-on brewery, brewery with all their equipment and how they bottle their beer and all the different types of beer that they do. So it's going from brewing a gallon of beer to brewing tens of thousands of gallons of beer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I like this. This is good. <laughs> this, is, this is a good progression. At Know How, we spare no expense. That's right. You didn't charge it to the card, did you? Uh, not this time. Okay, good, good. Folks, we understand that this was a lot of information, so we're going to make it easy for you to get growing on your own. If you want to see the kits that he used, if you want to see the notes that he got from his uh, interview with Russell, you can always go to our show notes page, which, uh, where is that, Frankie Hippo? Twit.tv slash KH, and like Padre says, you'll find the, the links for Mr. Beer and the Northern Brewer, and also any of the other information that we may have mentioned in the episode. Uh, but you can also subscribe and download. Yeah, and don't forget that you can find us on our uh, group page on, on uh, what is it, Google Plus. Google yeah, go Plus, to Google Plus. Where the Kitas live. The Kitas, our know it alls, 10,000 plus strong. It's a great place to go if you're a maker, if you're a DIYer of any experience. If you're an expert, please come in and share your knowledge with the younger folk. If you're brand new at this, come in and hopefully our folks will be warm and welcoming and bring you into the wonderful world of making things by yourself. Again, just go to Google Plus and look for know-how. There is an approval process because we try to keep out the spam accounts, but we approve everyone. Come on in and enjoy yourself. That's right. But if you want to see when, <laughs> what kind of beer I'm drinking when now. I'm not on know-how, you'll want to follow us on Twitter. I am at Cranky underscore Hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. If you follow us on Twitter, it's a fantastic way to find out no. why our My beer. director is taking the beer away. <laughs> he These loves things beer. things happen. It's mm, weird. But weird. you're going to find him, because he's far away from the mute button, at twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3. Too late. Too, too late. late. Oh, that's <laughs> that's right. right. Win this what round, happens. Padre. <laughs> Touche. Until next time, I am Father Robert Ballasare. I'm uh, Brian Burnett. And now that you brew how, go drink it. It's a fine dark ale. It's a nice bouquet, right? With notes of, um, Sugar? <laughs> Rat feces. <laughs> That's, <laughs> it adds a flavor. It does. That's what that, the secret <laughs> ingredient in Coke. <laughs>